if you truly want more out of life, chances are you're not really going to fit in anywhere. I mean really fit it in. Because the majority of people settle for average, and if you don't drop down to their level, there's going to be conflict. They won't like the fact that you are committed to your dreams because it reminds them that they gave up on theirs. One of the biggest reasons most people don't follow through with their dream life is fear that they will be left out if they achieve it. This may be conscious or unconscious, but most people give up not because they can't make it, not because they are incapable, but because they are surrounded by people who have settled. People who don't want to see you succeed because that will remind them they did. They might start saying you've changed that you become successful not understanding that your goal was always to change, to develop, to reinvent yourself. You will hear ridiculous comments like successful people are greedy, or my favorite there's more to life than money. Of course there's more to life than money, there's also more to life than struggling to pay bills and put food on the table. If you truly want more out of life, chances are you're not really going to fit in anywhere. I mean really fit it in. Because the majority of people settle for average, and if you don't drop down to their level, there's going to be conflict. They won't like the fact that you are committed to your dreams because it reminds them that they gave up on theirs. One of the biggest reasons most people don't follow through with their dream life is fear that they will be left out if they achieve it. This may be conscious or unconscious, but most people give up not because they can't make it, not because they are incapable, but because they are surrounded by people who have settled. People who don't want to see you succeed because that will remind them they did. They might start saying you've changed that you become successful not understanding that your goal was always to change, to develop, to reinvent yourself. You will hear ridiculous comments like successful people are greedy, or my favorite there's more to life than money. Of course there's more to life than money, there's also more to life than struggling to pay bills and put food on the table. Placement, layering, and integration are common to most current money laundering strategies. Placement is the process through which ill-gotten gains are transformed into assets that appear to be lawful. Depositing money into a bank account registered to an anonymous company or a professional intermediary is a common method of accomplishing this. Because of the sudden infusion of enormous funds into the financial system, this is the stage of the criminal enterprise where the greatest risk of detection exists. Using several transactions to further obscure the source of funds is the second phase in this process, which is known as layering. For example, the acquisition of marketable property like luxury automobiles, artwork and real estate might be a form of this. Layering is common at casinos, too, because of the high volume of transactions. If a money launderer has a gambling account at a casino chain's facilities in other countries or works with personnel to rig the games, they may be able to do so. Finally, integration permits clean money to return to the mainstream economy and benefit the original criminal. Investing in a legitimate firm and claiming payment through fictitious invoices is one option, another is to create an unregistered charitable organization, where they may command a hefty salary by serving on the board of directors. Placement, layering, and integration are common to most current money laundering strategies. 
Placement is the process through which ill-gotten gains are transformed into assets that appear to be lawful. Depositing money into a bank account registered to an anonymous company or a professional intermediary is a common method of accomplishing this. Because of the sudden infusion of enormous funds into the financial system, this is the stage of the criminal enterprise where the greatest risk of detection exists. Using several transactions to further obscure the source of funds is the second phase in this process, which is known as layering. For example, the acquisition of marketable property like luxury automobiles, artwork and real estate might be a form of this. Layering is common at casinos, too, because of the high volume of transactions. If a money launderer has a gambling account at a casino chain's facilities in other countries or works with personnel to rig the games, they may be able to do so. Finally, integration permits clean money to return to the mainstream economy and benefit the original criminal. Investing in a legitimate firm and claiming payment through fictitious invoices is one option, another is to create an unregistered charitable organization, where they may command a hefty salary by serving on the board of directors. Sometimes it's the tiny things that may make large things happen. Fleas and the disease, atoms and nuclear weapons. Diminutive leaders in global history. Soot is one of these small things. Soot also known as black carbon is created when you burn dung, coal, diesel fuel and wood. From Los Angeles to Mumbai, soot causes respiratory ailments including lung cancer and asthma and leads to 1.6 million premature deaths every year. Mostly among the impoverished. And it gets worse. Atmospheric currents carry soot hundreds of miles from where it is created, to the Himalayas and the Arctic. Black carbon being black, absorbs sunlight, therefore even a little soot on snow helps it melt faster. And when snow melts global sea levels rise, endangering our freshwater indigenous settlements and polar bears who prey on the Arctic ice. Climate change has been a huge phenomenon for a long and carbon dioxide has been its main cause. Scientists believe that soot contributes 25% of human-caused global warming. It's the second largest source of Arctic warming after carbon dioxide. Let's not underestimate the significance of this little particle. Black carbon reduction may be the fastest approach to reduce global warming, though. Pay for the Arctic experience. Changing a light bulb is even more time-consuming than this. Reducing black carbon, which is only in the atmosphere for a few weeks, will have an immediate impact. Even while lowering soot alone would not solve global warming, tackling our soot problem now will help buy time for the Arctic and allow us to address the larger problem of carbon dioxide. There are cleaner industries, cook stoves, and diesel now that we must utilize them, therefore we must use them. While wealthy countries have made major reductions in their black carbon emissions, there is still more work to be done in this area. We must raise the bar at home and support the development of greener technology in the developing world. You could feel insignificant in a world with over 7 billion people. Because the US government and the European Union should be leading efforts to reduce black carbon emissions, your efforts can have a significant impact. Visit www.stopsuit.org for more information. And you can do your part to prevent these minor annoyances from wreaking havoc. Sometimes it's the tiny things that may make large things happen. Fleas and the disease, atoms and nuclear weapons. Diminutive leaders in global history. Soot is one of these small things. Soot also known as black carbon is created when you burn dung, coal, diesel fuel and wood. From Los Angeles to Mumbai, soot causes respiratory ailments including lung cancer and asthma and leads to 1.6 million premature deaths every year. Mostly among the impoverished. And it gets worse. Atmospheric currents carry soot hundreds of miles from where it is created, to the Himalayas and the Arctic. Black carbon being black, absorbs sunlight, therefore even a little soot on snow helps it melt faster. And when snow melts global sea levels rise, endangering our freshwater indigenous settlements and polar bears who prey on the Arctic ice. Climate change has been a huge phenomenon for a long and carbon dioxide has been its main cause. 
Scientists believe that soot contributes 25% of human-caused global warming. It's the second largest source of Arctic warming after carbon dioxide. Let's not underestimate the significance of this little particle. Black carbon reduction may be the fastest approach to reduce global warming, though. Pay for the Arctic experience. Changing a light bulb is even more time-consuming than this. Reducing black carbon, which is only in the atmosphere for a few weeks, will have an immediate impact. Even while lowering soot alone would not solve global warming, tackling our soot problem now will help buy time for the Arctic and allow us to address the larger problem of carbon dioxide. There are cleaner industries, cook stoves, and diesel now that we must utilize them, therefore we must use them. While wealthy countries have made major reductions in their black carbon emissions, there is still more work to be done in this area. We must raise the bar at home and support the development of greener technology in the developing world. You could feel insignificant in a world with over 7 billion people. Because the US government and the European Union should be leading efforts to reduce black carbon emissions, your efforts can have a significant impact. Visit www.stopsuit.org for more information. And you can do your part to prevent these minor annoyances from wreaking havoc. It is my intention to discuss something that humans may have in common with other animals, namely emotion, at this period. We'll also go through some cutting-edge techniques like functional magnetic resonance imaging fMRI, and brain imaging, which we use to investigate some long-standing problems concerning motivation and emotion. I'll begin by introducing you to the situation, which some of you may already be familiar with. Over a century ago, Pavlov came up with this idea. So, the dog hears a sound, waits for it to be repeated, and then sees food powder. This scenario occurs frequently, and things begin to change in the middle of what we've previously established as the starting point. Things start to get interesting around here. During Pavlov's experiment, he found that a dog's salivation rises as its paralysis progresses. However, there were other events that took place here as well. Things are getting crazy around here now that you've got a puppy. The experiment I'm going to discuss today was designed to capture what was going on in the brain to produce the Pavlovian condition. However, you may also think of the state of affairs in terms of how the dogs are feeling, or how you are feeling before lunch today. State It is my intention to discuss something that humans may have in common with other animals, namely emotion, at this period. We'll also go through some cutting-edge techniques like functional magnetic resonance imaging fMRI, and brain imaging, which we use to investigate some long-standing problems concerning motivation and emotion. I'll begin by introducing you to the situation, which some of you may already be familiar with. Over a century ago, Pavlov came up with this idea. So, the dog hears a sound, waits for it to be repeated, and then sees food powder. This scenario occurs frequently, and things begin to change in the middle of what we've previously established as the starting point. Things start to get interesting around here. During Pavlov's experiment, he found that a dog's salivation rises as its paralysis progresses. However, there were other events that took place here as well. Things are getting crazy around here now that you've got a puppy. The experiment I'm going to discuss today was designed to capture what was going on in the brain to produce the Pavlovian condition. However, you may also think of the state of affairs in terms of how the dogs are feeling, or how you are feeling before lunch today. State This terrestrial animal has the biggest brain and the highest encephalization ratio. The elephant's EQ is almost as high as a chimpanzee's, which is a measure of brain size in relation to body mass. 
There are as many neurons and synapses and a well-developed hippocampus and cerebral cortex in it as in the human brain, even though it is distantly related. When it comes to remembering the past, it's the hippocampus, which is intimately linked to emotions, that helps. As a result, elephant memory is far more complicated and adaptive than rote memorization. There are a number of reasons why older matriarchs are better able to notice the warning symptoms of drought in their adult elephants. Elephants are one of the rare non-human animals that suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of their experiences. A problem-solving ability that elephants demonstrate in many innovative ways is the result of the cerebral cortex. Additionally, they work together to find solutions to difficulties, often outwitting and manipulating their colleagues in the process. They've also mastered fundamental mathematics, as seen by their ability to keep track of the relative quantities of fruit in two baskets despite several alterations. This terrestrial animal has the biggest brain and the highest encephalization ratio. The elephant's EQ is almost as high as a chimpanzee's, which is a measure of brain size in relation to body mass. There are as many neurons and synapses and a well-developed hippocampus and cerebral cortex in it as in the human brain, even though it is distantly related. When it comes to remembering the past, it's the hippocampus, which is intimately linked to emotions, that helps. As a result, elephant memory is far more complicated and adaptive than rote memorization. There are a number of reasons why older matriarchs are better able to notice the warning symptoms of drought in their adult elephants. Elephants are one of the rare non-human animals that suffer from post-traumatic stress disorder as a result of their experiences. A problem-solving ability that elephants demonstrate in many innovative ways is the result of the cerebral cortex. Additionally, they work together to find solutions to difficulties, often outwitting and manipulating their colleagues in the process. They've also mastered fundamental mathematics, as seen by their ability to keep track of the relative quantities of fruit in two baskets despite several alterations. Keep in mind the following two points, before we get started, I want you to go back to when you learn to ride a bike. If you've ever fallen off a bike, you've probably acquired some sort of scarring from the impact. The next skill I want you to retain is the fundamentals of bicycle operation. It is because of this that I requested you to recall both of these memories, as they belong to two distinct types of memory. Memory is a dynamic and ever-changing mechanism that requires a great deal of attention. To help with this, psychologists have sought to break down memory into smaller chunks. In general, there are two types. The term, explicit memory, refers to a memory that may be recalled consciously and voluntarily. This is your recollection of going over the handlebars and spraining your knee while riding a bike as a child. Similarly, there's the implicit memory, which is a sort of memory that can't be recalled consciously. This is your recollection of how to properly mount and off a bicycle. A lot of the time, they aren't linked with visual memories, but rather muscular memories. Language use, driving, reading and answering numerous questions on a test are instances of implicit memory. Let's take a closer look at how aging affects both conscious and implicit memory. It's a type of memory that's used for experimentation or as a tool in the workplace. Explicit memory is made up of a large number of memories that are intimately linked to specific points in time, places, and individuals. Implicit memory is quite different from this. Remembering people's birthdays and answering several questions on the test are instances of explicit memory.
Keep in mind the following two points. Before we get started, I want you to go back to when you learn to ride a bike. If you've ever fallen off a bike, you've probably acquired some sort of scarring from the impact. The next skill I want you to retain is the fundamentals of bicycle operation. It is because of this that I requested you to recall both of these memories, as they belong to two distinct types of memory. Memory is a dynamic and ever-changing mechanism that requires a great deal of attention. To help with this, psychologists have sought to break down memory into smaller chunks. In general, there are two types. The term, explicit memory, refers to a memory that may be recalled consciously and voluntarily. This is your recollection of going over the handlebars and spraining your knee while riding a bike as a child. Similarly, there's the implicit memory, which is a sort of memory that can't be recalled consciously. This is your recollection of how to properly mount and off a bicycle. A lot of the time, they aren't linked with visual memories, but rather muscular memories. Language use, driving, reading and answering numerous questions on a test are instances of implicit memory. Let's take a closer look at how aging affects both conscious and implicit memory. It's a type of memory that's used for experimentation or as a tool in the workplace. Explicit memory is made up of a large number of memories that are intimately linked to specific points in time, places, and individuals. Implicit memory is quite different from this. Remembering people's birthdays and answering several questions on the test are instances of explicit memory. Good school facilities have a significant influence on student learning results and teacher retention. Students' behavior, engagement, learning, and progress are all aided by good facilities. According to the study, three-quarters of schools have insufficient building features, and 58% of schools have an undesirable atmosphere. The majority of the schools lack modern amenities. It's one of the most significant indicators of student growth and teacher retention. Despite the considerable expense of renovating the facilities, the end effect will be spectacular. Acoustics, air quality, lighting, temperature, and space are five components of the school facilities that need to be enhanced. The first is acoustics. Schools with lower noise levels had better performance than schools with greater acoustic levels, according to studies. Students and instructors are less distracted when there is less noise. Good air quality is the second most critical characteristic. Many schools suffer from sick building syndrome, which causes student absenteeism and poor performance. Because of the poor quality of the airflow, students with asthma are impacted. Bacteria, viruses, and allergens that contribute to juvenile disorders thrive in poorly ventilated environments. A decent lighting system should be installed in every school. Good lighting is also important for student development. This not only enhances student and instructor morale, but it also helps to reduce off-task behavior. A comfortable temperature is also an important aspect of a successful school. In a school setting, working at an insufficient temperature is quite challenging. The optimal temperature is between 68 and 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Last but not least, big classrooms are a vital feature. Aggression is usually connected to overcrowding in the classroom. Good school facilities have a significant influence on student learning results and teacher retention. Students' behavior, engagement, learning, and progress are all aided by good facilities. According to the study, three-quarters of schools have insufficient building features, and 58% of schools have an undesirable atmosphere. The majority of the schools lack modern amenities. It's one of the most significant indicators of student growth and teacher retention. Despite the considerable expense of renovating the facilities, the end effect will be spectacular. Acoustics, air quality, lighting, temperature, and space are five components of the school facilities that need to be enhanced. The first is acoustics. Schools with lower noise levels had better performance than schools with greater acoustic levels, according to studies. Students and instructors are less distracted when there is less noise. 
Good air quality is the second most critical characteristic. Many schools suffer from sick building syndrome, which causes student absenteeism and poor performance. Because of the poor quality of the airflow, students with asthma are impacted. Bacteria, viruses, and allergens that contribute to juvenile disorders thrive in poorly ventilated environments. A decent lighting system should be installed in every school. Good lighting is also important for student development. This not only enhances student and instructor morale, but it also helps to reduce off-task behavior. A comfortable temperature is also an important aspect of a successful school. In a school setting, working at an insufficient temperature is quite challenging. The optimal temperature is between 68 and 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Last but not least, big classrooms are a vital feature. Aggression is usually connected to overcrowding in the classroom. We make and expect concessions in marriage all too frequently without considering the true cost. Even yet, it is wise for us to examine the costs and benefits of our marriage actions in the same manner that divorce law instructs us to. I want individuals to see their marriage agreements through the divorce prism. What is marriage but an exchange of sacrifice, one may ask? What are our impressions of our conversation? Second, how should we approach the issue of child care in light of the reality that there is no universally available system of free child care? How to handle the reality that some things can be independent and if we don't think about it, they will all be part of the common venture. What I want to leave you with is that, whether you marry or divorce, marriage is a union that lasts forever, till death to us part. We make and expect concessions in marriage all too frequently without considering the true cost. Even yet, it is wise for us to examine the costs and benefits of our marriage actions in the same manner that divorce law instructs us to. I want individuals to see their marriage agreements through the divorce prism. What is marriage but an exchange of sacrifice, one may ask? What are our impressions of our conversation? Second, how should we approach the issue of child care in light of the reality that there is no universally available system of free child care? How to handle the reality that some things can be independent and if we don't think about it, they will all be part of the common venture. What I want to leave you with is that, whether you marry or divorce, marriage is a union that lasts forever, till death to us part. Are you having sleepless nights? Many of us encounter troubles when attempting to fall asleep on a nightly basis. Without a great night's sleep, we could face various obstacles the next day. What is keeping you awake? Here are a few possible reasons. 1. Messy bedroom. 2. Naps throughout the day. 3. Skipping breakfast. These are just a few of the possible reasons. Here are three different ways to fall asleep quicker at night. Progressive muscle relaxation. This relaxation technique involves tightening and tense all the muscle groups that you can, and then relax them. By doing so repeatedly, we are able to promote physical relaxation which will also provide beneficial results in our day-to-day -day activities. Progressive muscle relaxation provides you with less tension within your muscles, lower blood pressure, decreased levels of anxiety, overall lower levels of fatigue. Through doing this exercise nightly you are physically relaxing yourself as well as calming your mind. Don't use your mobile as an alarm, we've all done it most of it still doing it on a nightly basis. The truth is using our mobile phones as an alarm clock is infected prying us from sleep. Most of us are keen to have our devices on us at all times whether we are exchanging texts or sending and receiving emails. By keeping our mobile devices within reach at night, we are keeping our minds and muscles engaged. Due to the engagement right before bed you will find yourself taking longer to fall asleep. Sleep is all about relaxation and while we all would like to remain involved those messages throughout the night are subconsciously waking us up in an action known as arousal. This is the process of the mind awakening without the body and in most cases we are completely unaware of it the next day. 
Listen to soothing sounds. Our bodies are more apt for sounds when we are conscious trying to fall asleep rather than when we are dozed off. If your sleeping problem is due to excessive background noise, you may find peace by listening to soothing background music. Once you find the routine that best helps you fall asleep, you should follow it consistently. Once our bodies are trained to follow our sleep habits, we will find ourselves falling asleep quicker. Are you having sleepless nights? Many of us encounter troubles when attempting to fall asleep on a nightly basis. Without a great night's sleep, we could face various obstacles the next day. What is keeping you awake? Here are a few possible reasons. 1. Messy bedroom. 2. Naps throughout the day. 3. Skipping breakfast. These are just a few of the possible reasons. Here are three different ways to fall asleep quicker at night. Progressive muscle relaxation. This relaxation technique involves tightening and tense all the muscle groups that you can, and then relax them. By doing so repeatedly, we are able to promote physical relaxation which will also provide beneficial results in our day-to-day -day activities. Progressive muscle relaxation provides you with less tension within your muscles, lower blood pressure, decreased levels of anxiety, overall lower levels of fatigue. Through doing this exercise nightly you are physically relaxing yourself as well as calming your mind. Don't use your mobile as an alarm, we've all done it most of it still doing it on a nightly basis. The truth is using our mobile phones as an alarm clock is infected prying us from sleep. Most of us are keen to have our devices on us at all times whether we are exchanging texts or sending and receiving emails. By keeping our mobile devices within reach at night, we are keeping our minds and muscles engaged. Due to the engagement right before bed you will find yourself taking longer to fall asleep. Sleep is all about relaxation and while we all would like to remain involved those messages throughout the night are subconsciously waking us up in an action known as arousal. This is the process of the mind awakening without the body and in most cases we are completely unaware of it the next day. Listen to soothing sounds. Our bodies are more apt for sounds when we are conscious trying to fall asleep rather than when we are dozed off. If your sleeping problem is due to excessive background noise, you may find peace by listening to soothing background music. Once you find the routine that best helps you fall asleep, you should follow it consistently. Once our bodies are trained to follow our sleep habits, we will find ourselves falling asleep quicker. Wind, tides, variations in water density, and the Earth's rotation all influence ocean currents. Those motions are influenced by the ocean floor and shoreline's terrain, causing currents to accelerate up, slow down, or change direction. There are two basic types of ocean currents, surface and deep ocean currents. Surface currents govern the movement of the ocean's surface water, while deep ocean currents mobilize the remaining 90%. Surface and deep ocean currents interact in a complex dance that maintains the whole ocean in motion, despite their divergent origins. The wind and tides create surface currents along the coast, which move water back and forth as the water level rises and falls. Surface currents in the open ocean are mostly driven by wind. Top layer water is dragged along by the wind as it blows over the ocean. There are several layers of sediment and sedimentary rock beneath the surface of running water, and those layers pull on the ones beneath them.
wind, tides, variations in water density, and the Earth's rotation all influence ocean currents. Those motions are influenced by the ocean floor and shoreline's terrain, causing currents to accelerate up, slow down, or change direction. There are two basic types of ocean currents, surface and deep ocean currents. Surface currents govern the movement of the ocean's surface water, while deep ocean currents mobilize the remaining 90%. Surface and deep ocean currents interact in a complex dance that maintains the whole ocean in motion, despite their divergent origins. The wind and tides create surface currents along the coast, which move water back and forth as the water level rises and falls. Surface currents in the open ocean are mostly driven by wind. Top layer water is dragged along by the wind as it blows over the ocean. There are several layers of sediment and sedimentary rock beneath the surface of running water, and those layers pull on the ones beneath them. 